สวัสดีค่ะสหายนายธรณีพ้นพวกเราในธรณีนี้ขอส่งมิตรจิตมาถึงท่านทุกคน Sayın Türkçe bilen arkadaşlarımız sabah şeriflerinize hayırlı olsun. Darasılayma previt iz naşoğa svitu, bajayma şahsya, zoroya inno hayalita. Assalamu alaikum. Ham zemin ke rehne walo ki taraf se aapko khush amdid kehte hain. Chân thành gửi tới các bạn lời chào thân hữu. Yehi dai huyya naur akanoizoy. We do that in alphabetical theory that because we want great order to be for everyone, not just those who can afford it. I'll explain that again at the end. You can pay cash or card on your way out. Uh, masks are compulsory unless you're exempt, even in a the theatre. So if you've got drinks with you, take them down when you have a drink, pop it back up. That would be much, much appreciated. If you've got a phone, can you just make sure it's off or on silent, please? That would be massively helpful. If there's a fire alarm that goes off, it is not part of the show. Just make your way calmly out of that door and we will usher you to safety from there. And the last thing for me to be a housekeeping is enjoy tonight's performance of 600 people. تحياتنا للأصدقاء في النجوم يا ليت يجمعنا الزمان شلام بولور أنونت بورغ كتنوين يزيركي ميكامازو تشونيرين أنتين بوخ تشونير نمشكار بشي شانتي هوك Greetings. Uh, how are you? Are you well? Uh, greetings to you, whoever you are. Uh, hail. Um, peace. We come in friendship to those who are friends. How are you, people of other planets? <laughs> Greetings from a human of the Earth. Please contact. Friends of space, how are you all? Have you eaten yet? Come and visit us if you have the time. Greetings to our friends in the stars. We wish that we will meet you someday. We step out of our solar system seeking only peace and friendship. To teach if we are called upon, to be taught if we are fortunate. We know full well that our planet and all of its inhabitants are but a tiny part of the immense universe that surrounds us. And it is with humility and hope that we take this step. 5th of September 1977. Space probe Voyager 1 blasts off from Space Launch Complex 41 in Cape Canaveral in Florida. Voyager 1 launches two weeks after sister ship Voyager 2. Why didn't they just number them the other way around? <laughs> The two Voyager space probes both leave the Earth bearing a gold-plated copper record, a gramophone needle, and instructions as to how to build a record player. Encoded onto the audio discs in binary are a sequence of images depicting life on, on the planet Earth in the 1970s. Mountains, cities, the Taj Mahal, Houses from all around the world, insects, fish, dolphins, a frog sitting in someone's hand, 
Chimpanzees just mooching about whilst human beings take photographs of them. A woman performing gymnastics. A man riding an elephant. A man eating a grape in a vineyard. A woman eating a grape in a supermarket. That's technically stealing, that. <laughs> Human beings gathered around an all-terrain vehicle that has got wedged into an icy crevasse. This typical, everyday image is intended as a joke. And it's a joke being made by the NASA scientists who are behind the Voyager mission. And the joke is intended for whichever alien scientists decode these images. It's a scientist joke that says, oh, technology, eh? Two alien scientists in, okay. Uh, and there are images of human beings, families, anatomical diagrams of the human body. Following the images recorded as audio, there is a, a sequence of, uh, of music, music from all around the world, music like this. And like this. And this. Serious. Uh, this. Which is a bit more my cup of tea. Uh, this. And obviously this. It's like the law, they have to put this on everything. Uh, and this. And this. Plus the sound of thunder, wind, waves, laughter, Morse code, dogs barking, birds singing, a tractor in a field, a jet fighter in the sky, a train in the distance, a heart beating, a baby crying, and a kiss. Nineteenth of December. 1977. Voyager 1 overtakes sister ship Voyager 2. March 1979. Voyager 1 passes Jupiter and its moons Amalthea, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. November 1980. Voyager 1 passes Saturn and its moons Titan, Tethys, Mimas, Enceladus, Rhea and Hyperion. December 1980. Taking a slingshot route around the moon Titan means that Voyager 1 will not pass any more of the outer planets on its way out of the solar system. Valentine's Day, 1990. Voyager 1 takes her last photographs of the solar system in a sequence of images that will become known as the family portrait and that will include the image of the Earth that becomes famously known as the pale blue dot. 17th of February 1998, Voyager 1 overtakes Pioneer 10 as the most distant human-made object from the Sun. 15th of December 2004, Voyager 1 passes the termination shock. Whatever that is. December 2006, and Voyager 1 is passing through the heliopause at the very edge of our solar system. And I am sitting in a small office in the University of Sheffield's Hicks building. And the office belongs to Dr. Simon Goodwin. And Dr. Simon Goodwin is an astrophysicist. And Simon's office looks very much as you would hope the office of an academic astrophysicist would look. The desk is too small and it's covered in teetering piles of paper. There's a blocky desktop PC that looks like it would take about 10 minutes to boot up if you ever bothered to turn it on. But he doesn't need to, does he? Because he's got his brain. The whiteboard is covered in gratifyingly complicated looking diagrams and indecipherable formulae. The shelves are laden with books and are also home to four or five models of spaceships from the Star Wars films made out of Lego. There's a small table which is where we actually sit and Simon himself is wearing a big woolly jumper with a rainbow and some stars knitted into it. 
And I'm in Simon's office because I saw an advert for a talk that Simon was going to give about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. When I realised I wasn't going to be able to make it along to his actual talk, I got in touch with Simon through the university website and he very kindly invited me up to his office one morning for a chat, a chat about the search for alien intelligence in our galaxy. I'd better warn you though, he said in his email, I don't think there is any. Oh. I came into the Hicks building on street level, obviously, Although I don't remember coming up any stairs, this is a real Sheffield thing. In Simon's office, I'm up on the fifth floor of the building. The view southeast across Sheffield is probably pretty impressive, but I don't really pay it any attention. It's 10 a.m. midweek, December 2006. Over the course of the next three hours of conversation, Dr. Simon Goodwin will change the way I understand the galaxy. So, we've found about 209 planets so far around other stars. Footnote, uh, just a reminder that this conversation is happening in 2006. If it was happening now, Simon would be telling me that we found about 4,803 planets around other stars, but it's 2006, so it's 209 planets around other stars. And we can tell if a star has planets around it because it wobbles. It's the gravitational pull of the planets in orbit around it. They make it wobble. We call this phenomena stellar wobble. When we find the planet, we analyse its atmosphere. We're we're looking for uh, the way it refracts light. So we're looking for evidence of oxygen in the atmosphere because then we know there must be life. People often think it's the other way around, but actually you have to have life in order to have oxygen. And of course we're looking for oxygen because we're looking for evidence of life as we know it. Because how would we recognise an indicator of a life form we can't imagine? We know that life started very quickly on Earth because we know that simple life starts very easily. You just need the right range of atmospheric pressures, the right range of temperatures, shake it up a little bit, and single cell life just appears. Footnote. I interrupted Simon at this point, and I said, what do you mean single cell life just appears? What actually happens? And looking back, I can see that Simon didn't actually answer that question. He said something about being an astrophysicist, not an astrobiologist. But what he did say was that the thing is, life rarely survives because climates change and life dies out. We know that life very probably started on Venus and on Mars. But Venus is just too hot a planet for life to survive for long, and Mars is too cold a planet for complex life to survive. And that's the challenge, complexity. But the more complex life gets, the more limited the range of environments in which it can survive. And then life, and then climate changes, and life dies out. You know, we know that on Earth, the oxygen catastrophe happened almost overnight. Footnote, a reminder that Simon is an astrophysicist. So when he says almost overnight, what he actually means is over the course of about two million years. <laughs> on Earth, the oxygen catastrophe happened almost overnight. New species appeared that produced oxygen. The atmosphere began to fill with oxygen. And species that didn't like oxygen in the atmosphere, they began to die out. And that is what's wrong with Jurassic Park. Because if you did bring dinosaurs back to life now, they would just all die straight away, wouldn't they? Because there's no longer enough oxygen in the atmosphere for them to survive. You know, we found sp fossils of spiders as big as people. Seriously, you know, because spiders breathe through hairs on their bodies, don't they? So the maximum size a spider can get to is governed by two factors, isn't it? It's governed by its surface area to volume ratio, which of course you all remember from GCSE physics, or you wouldn't be here in this astrophysics lecture. And then the other factor is the pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere. So these days, a tarantula, which is very hairy, remember, that's about as big as a spider can get. But a few hundred million years ago, when oxygen was at 35% in our atmosphere, spiders could get very big indeed. You know, you should really check out the Carboniferous period because there was some weird shit alive back then. Footnote. Simon has asked me to point out that there is a small possibility that the fossilised giant spider's legs that we found 
could have belonged to a spider crab. But that's not as good a story, is it? After complexity, what we're looking for is intelligence. Well, as a colleague of mine observed to me the other day, the thing about human beings is when, when we're asked to identify signs of intelligence, what we tend to do is we look at behaviour exhibited by us, but not, not exhibited by other species, and we say, ah, yes, that, that is a sign of intelligence. But the more we look at other species for these signs of human intelligence, the more we find them. You know, we, we look for problem-solving ability. We'll take octopuses. Is it octopuses or octopi? <laughs> Simon really doesn't know if it's octopuses or octopi. What is it? Octop there was an octopi first from there, but then a lot of octopuses over there. Sounds better. Screech. Screech. Okay. Octopuses? Okay, that's good. Yeah, we'll give that tonight. Any octopuses? Okay, okay. But the point <laughs> is, the point about them is, getting out of hand. So the point. <laughs> The point, the point is they're good problem solvers, okay, that's the, that's the point. We look, for, uh, we look for use of tools. You know, well, lots of species do that, don't they? You know, birds build nests. So, for, for precision, tool use is defined as the, the use of objects around us to perform tasks. And I'd not thought about this, uh, about bird's nests like this before, but a bird's nest has structural design and then it uses different materials for rigidity and insulation and comfort. So birds are architects and interior designers. And chimpanzees, they use sticks, don't they? I mean, mainly to hit each other with, but, but a weapon is a tool, you know. And, and chimpanzees are really interesting for lots of other reasons, of course, as well. You know, we've, we've demonstrated that chimpanzees have got a really well-developed sense of fair play. And we've been doing experiments with chimpanzees for years now where we reward them for performing tasks. And we reward them with bananas, obviously. But if you get two chimpanzees to carry out the same task, and then you reward them with a different number of bananas, they know that's not right. And they all kick off and all of the chimpanzees go on strike until you make it right again and pay everyone the same. We've done other uh, similar experiments with capuchin monkeys. Uh, where we introduce them to a simple exchange mechanism, uh, we give them some tokens, and each token is worth one banana. But the banana shop is only open first thing in the morning. In an early version of this experiment, it wasn't very long before one of the monkeys bought their banana in the morning, but they didn't eat it. They held on to it until the afternoon, when the other monkeys were hungry, but the banana shop was closed. And then they sold their banana for two tokens. <laughs> Footnote, in the right circumstances, left to their own devices, capuchin monkeys invent capitalism. <laughs> we look for richness of language. Problem here is that most of the time we just don't know what animals are talking about. So, an example of this, uh, green monkeys, Sabaeus monkeys, when they're frightened, they start screeching. And to our ears, it's just a racket. But if you record and analyse those screeches, what you discover is they have a different screech for a different danger. So they've got one screech for, look out, an eagle! And another screech for, look out, a lion! And these aren't just like instinctive noises they're making. They do know what this language means because scientists have also observed two Sabaeus monkeys both trying to get to the same banana but the, the monkey that was furthest away realised they weren't going to get to the banana in time. And so they went, look out, an eagle! And their mate turned round and went, what, where? And so they got to the banana first. <laughs> of course, the richest uh, non-human language on the earth is, is dolphin. So if... If you imagine a language that you don't understand, one where you don't even understand the alphabet, you know, so for me it'd be like Chinese or Russian. If you were to record two people speaking that language to each other and then you were to analyse the recording, you wouldn't be able to understand what they were talking about, but you would be able to tell that the language itself was rich in information. Well, the same is true when we record and analyse dolphins having conversations. And we're confident now as well that dolphins have individual names for each other, just like we do. Footnote. Ah, oh. <laughs> Lovely dolphins. 
<laughs> and I bet none of them are called King Flipper, are they? Because if you think about it, that's the equivalent of human beings calling our children arm or leg. If dolphins can understand humans talking, which is beginning to sound increasingly possible, if you ask me, they must be like really disappointed with our lack of imagination. <laughs> After intelligence, what we're looking for is consciousness, self-awareness, an understanding that you are alive. So one of the ways we measure this is known as the mirror test. When an individual looks at themselves in the mirror, do they understand that what they're seeing is their own reflection or, or do they think that that is another member of their own species? So there are three species on Earth that, uh, that regularly pass the mirror test. And those three species are human beings, chimpanzees, and dolphins. And one of the interesting aspects of being able to pass the mirror test is not only that you understand that you are an individual and you are alive, you understand that every other member of your species is an individual and that they are alive and that their life can be stopped. So a lot of species on Earth kill other species for food, you know, driven by hunger, or even kill members of their own species through impromptu violence driven by competition or anger. But only three species on Earth carry out premeditated murder. And those three species are human beings, chimpanzees, and dolphins. Dolphins murder in packs of four. That's just the mathematical minimum that they need. Dolphins one and two, they swim down and they keep the victim dolphin underwater by swimming either side of it and just above it. Dolphins three and four, they swim up to the surface and they take a breath and then they swim down and swap places with dolphins one and two and they, they basically tag team like this for long enough until the victim dolphin drowns. Ah, oh. lovely dolphins. I'm not going to worry about buying dolphin-friendly tuna again. Dolphins aren't even dolphin-friendly. <laughs> it's clever, though, isn't it? It's like, you know, shows planning and cooperation and an understanding that life can be stopped. But none of this is what we're talking about, is it? When we say we're looking for alien life. What we're talking about is finding a species that is intelligent enough to receive a message from us. What we're talking about is finding a species with a technological intelligence to intercept that message and decode it and translate it. We're talking about finding a species with the intelligence to reply, to send a message back. We're talking about finding a species, let's be honest, that is clever enough, that has the intelligence to build a spaceship that can travel across the galaxy and come and visit us. That's what we're looking for. So you're not just talking about finding life. I'm sure that's out there. You're talking about finding an extraterrestrial civilization. I've got to tell you, I don't think there are any. Not in our galaxy. I'll tell you why. Fermi's paradox. Okay. So, Fermi's paradox. So, Fermi's paradox has actually been identified by a number of different scientists over the years, but, but it was made famous in the name of Enrico Fermi in 1984 when Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine published an article about it and how it proved there were no extraterrestrial civilizations out there in the galaxy. Fermi's paradox goes like this The galaxy is big. Very, very big. There are billions of stars in it. Even if only some of those billions of stars have got planets, that's still going to be billions of planets. That's so many planets that statistically some of them just must have the right conditions for life, like the Earth have. And even if it's only a small proportion of billions of planets, that's still billions of planets with the right conditions for life. And even if only a fraction of those produce life, that's still going to be billions of planets that have produced life. The galaxy is old, very, very old, billions of years old. So some of those planets that must have produced life, the galaxy is so old that some of them must have had time for that life to evolve to a point of communicable intelligence. The galaxy is just so big and so old, some other planets must have produced life. 
in 100 years' time, human beings will have the technology to build a spacecraft that can intercept a comet, land on the comet, drill into the comet and mine it for ore and fuel, build a replica of itself, and then take off from the comet both of the spacecraft and intercept other comets. And in this way, we will be able to spread out from our solar system, reproducing technologically as we go. In just 100 years' time, we will have the technology to do that. And 100 years in galactic time is absolutely nothing. The chances of every other extraterrestrial civilization that is out there being at exactly the same point in its technological development, just unable to do that, uh, as us, is so infinitesimally small as to be impossible. A civilization just a thousand Earth years more developed than us will be capable of interstellar travel. So if we know they must be out there, and we know that some of them must be more technologically advanced than us, why haven't we heard from them? Where is everybody? In the interest of balance, I do have to point out that the following month, Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine published uh, a rebuttal article challenging the idea that Fermi's paradox proved there are no intelligent aliens out there. And the rebuttal argument goes like this. There are a lot of lemmings on the Earth, aren't there? And lemmings breed very fast, on average three times a year, and on average six or seven per young per litter. If you draw a graph of that population growth, you very quickly get to the point where the mass of lemmings on the Earth is greater than the mass of the Earth itself. <laughs> I've never seen a lemming. <laughs> that doesn't mean there aren't any out there, though, does it? Okay, so I'm not a scientist, but I know that that is a flawed scientific argument because even if you've not seen a lemming, you've seen evidence of lemmings, haven't you? You've seen loads of them being pushed off a, off a cliff by a film crew. So if you can get pushed off a cliff, you exist. But what does interest me about the lemming argument is that it is an attempt to solve Fermi's paradox. And there have been a lot of attempts to solve Fermi's paradox over the years. And generally, they, these attempts to solve the Fermi paradox, they fall into three different categories. So the first category of Fermi paradox solution, and these are the ones that are more popular with the general public on the whole, um, are all along the lines of, no, aliens do exist and they are here on Earth meddling in human affairs. Now, the problem these solutions tend to have is evidence uh, or lack of it. And so one of these, is, uh, one of these solutions is Hungarians are aliens, or descended from aliens. And the evidence for this is that the Hungarian language bears very few or no linguistic similarities to the languages spoken in the countries around it. So the most obvious explanation for that is... So the, the second category of Fermi solution, and these are the ones more favoured by the scientific community, are all basically around the idea that aliens are out there, they're just ignoring us until we're worth talking to. But what these, problem, these solutions all tend to have, the problem they have, is, is that they all assume that all of these extraterrestrial civilizations that are out there would have exactly the same attitude to us as each other and even within their own society. And they ignore the possibility of the galactic equivalent of some teenagers breaking into the zoo when it's closed and giving the game away. And then the third Fermi solution category... Well, there's only one solution in it, really, and that's the reason we haven't heard from any intelligent aliens is that there aren't any. But as one of Fermi's colleagues observed to him on the night he came up with a paradox, either we are not alone in the galaxy, or we are alone in the galaxy. Now, either one of those thoughts is mind-blowing, and one of them is true. <laughs> there is a more detailed response to Fermi's paradox that, that we can have a look at. That's the Drake equation. I'm sure you're all familiar with it anyway. Um, N equals R times FP times NE times FL times FI times FC times L, yeah? So this was coined by uh, astrophysicist Frank Drake in 1954 as a way of encouraging more people to have conversations about this. Uh, so it does actually predate Fermi's paradox, but it, um, but it is often used as a response to it. Uh, and one of the important things to know about the Drake equation is that it can tell us exactly how many extraterrestrial civilizations we can expect to be out there trying to communicate with us. 
because N, that's the number of extraterrestrial civilizations that are out there. And that is equal to R, the rate at which stars are born in our galaxy, times by FP, the fraction of those stars that have planets, times by NE, the number of those planets that have an environment suitable for life, times by FL, the fraction of them that actually produce life, times by FI, the fraction that produce intelligent life, times by FC, the fraction of those that produce communicably intelligent life, times by L, the length of time in Earth years that they have been trying to communicate with us. Now, the other important thing to know about the Drake equation is that it is completely useless because we don't know any of the numbers to put into it. So you can just put in whatever values you want to get out whatever answer you want to believe. Ah, the rate at which stars are born in our galaxy. Well, all right, we know that. That's, that's about uh, one a year, we think, stars are born. And yet, yeah, the fraction that have planets, well, we're much better at finding planets now. And the number that have an environment suitable for life, well... We could look at our solar system, couldn't we? And we can make an educated guess. But the fraction that produced life? Don't know. Intelligent life? No idea. Communicably intelligent life? I don't know. Length of time in Earth? Well, just pick a number. Any number you want. You know, it's totally random, isn't it? The problem with this is it's all theoretical. Hypothetical. What we want is some evidence. Let's talk to an astrophysicist. So there is one species that we can study when we want to look at the evolution of communicable intelligence. And that's us, isn't it? That's human beings. And when we do that, the evidence tells us that evolving to a point of technological communicable intelligence is incredibly difficult for a species to do. So difficult, in fact, that in doing so, a species will very nearly wipe itself out. We've now mapped human DNA, and using that map, we can trace the ancestry of anyone who gives us a DNA sample. Using the mitochondrial DNA, we all have passed down to us from our mothers through the maternal egg. And when we do that, the evidence tells us that everyone in this room tonight, everyone watching on the live stream, everyone alive on the earth today, in fact, was descended from one of about 600 individuals alive in the Rift Valley in Africa 150,000 years ago. 600 people. That's almost extinct. Six hundred people, almost extinct. And we were outnumbered too. Because those 600 people were Homo sapiens. But there were at least five other human species alive on the Earth at the same time. There was Homo neanderthalis, human from the Neander Valley, in what we now call Europe and the Middle East. Uh, Homo Denisova, human from the Denisova cave in Siberia. Homo erectus, in what we now call the, uh, the Far East, the upright human. Homo soloensis, human from Lake Solo in Java in Indonesia. And Homo floresiensis, human from the island of Flores, also in Indonesia. And Homo floresiensis, they were the smallest humans. They were, they were basically hobbits. And we had evolved in Africa from Homo rudolfensis, human from Lake Rudolf through Homo agaster, tool-using human, and we would eventually give ourselves the name Homo sapiens, wise humans. <laughs> but we weren't the biggest, we weren't the strongest, we weren't the fastest, and we weren't the cleverest. So how did we go on to become the dominant and then the only surviving human species on the Earth? Well, the theory goes like this. About 70,000 years ago, a small genetic mutation appeared in sapiens' brains that didn't make us cleverer, but it did give us a more complex understanding of human interaction. And it gave us a more supple and complex language with which to discuss this newfound understanding of human relationships. And crucially, it also gave us imagination and storytelling. And these three things together are known as the cognitive revolution. And and together, 
combined, they would give us the advantage we needed to spread out from Africa onto every land mass on the earth. But of course, the first thing we used the cognitive revolution for was to start gossiping. Because up to this point, a member of any sapiens tribe would be able to tell you who was the best hunter in the tribe, because that's just factual information. But now, what we could start to talk about was who in the tribe was really getting on particularly well, who in the tribe was sleeping with each other, who in the tribe had fallen out, who it was good to get put in a hunting team with, because they were good at strategy, who you probably wouldn't want to put in a hunting team together at the moment, because they fell out about the cave painting the other month and they still haven't made it up. So we understood better how people would work together and get on, and so our teamwork became better because we became better at planning. And when this was coupled with our newfound storytelling ability, we became very formidable indeed, because a member of any other human species could come back to their tribe and explain that they'd found some wildebeest roaming on the plain, but to get to the, the plain, you had to go through a valley, and there was a pride of lions in the valley, so it was probably too dangerous. But in Sapiens, what we could now talk about was how the tribe was actually protected by a lion spirit. And as long as we paid some sort of tribute, made some sort of sacrifice to the lion spirit, it would protect us as we went through the valley so it wouldn't be too dangerous. We invented myths and religions. And so now member, members of Sapiens who didn't know each other, strangers, could work towards the same goal because they believed the same things. And this let our teams get much bigger because because people were cooperating with an idea. And so our teams could become whole tribes, whole communities, whole societies, whole nations. And it's this capacity to believe that, let us go on to believe in other things that don't exist, like money, borders, limited liability companies, things that aren't real, but that have an effect on our lives because we choose to believe in them and enact them. I digress. So we spread out all around the world, and whenever we came across another human species, we either outcompeted it or we annihilated it. The evidence is inconclusive on that. But what we do know is that modern day Northern Europeans have between one and 4% Neanderthal DNA in our mix, and modern day East Asians have up to 6% Denisovan DNA in their mix. So there was definitely some cohabitation going on for some of the time. But by the time we crossed the water to the island of Flores, as recently as 50,000 years ago, and we met Homo floresiensis, and we wiped them out. Little hobbits. <laughs> we were the last surviving human species on the Earth. And then when the climate changed, we adapted and we survived. We believe now that the Garden of Eden was in Iraq 20 to 30,000 years ago, lush with vegetation. Then as the climate changed and the earth warmed up and the land around the equator began to dry out, Homo sapiens discovered irrigation and domesticating animals. We invented agriculture and so we survived. And different sapiens tribes discovered irrigation at about the same time all around the world, not through some sort of shared species consciousness, but through the same intelligence, meeting the same problem and coming up with the same solution. And so we went from 600 people, almost extinct, to 7.88 billion of us now. That's a more crowded planet. Some would say an overcrowded planet. But if it's just almost 8 billion of us in the entire galaxy, that's a bit less crowded, isn't it? You know, even at a conservative estimate, that's just one of us for every 40 or 50 stars. <laughs> Simon tells me this is called rare Earth theory. There's only us, because there's only the Earth, and that's why we should look after it. Simon tells me he is 99.5% convinced that there are no extraterrestrial civilizations out there. But that when he talks about it in public, he overstates his case for dramatic effect and he says he's 100% sure there are no intelligent aliens out there. And when he does that, there are always a handful of people who get very, very cross with him. It's as if, he imagines, he told a religious person that he can prove there is no God. And I'm fascinated with this, with our capacity to believe that there is something else out there, our capacity to believe in something other than ourselves. 
you know, if you go to the UK Patent Office and go through the files, you can find patented designs for flying saucers and interstellar spacecraft. I mean, you can also find patented designs for the umbrella hat and nappies for birds. <laughs> but the point is that we are imaginative and creative and inventive. And I sometimes wonder if we didn't start imagining what life might be like on other planets and then telling stories of adventures traveling between those planets and then imagining and designing and then patenting designs for spaceships capable of traveling across the galaxy to prove to ourselves that it was possible. I was really taken with the idea that the Voyager space probes were messages in bottles cast out onto the vast galactic ocean to one day be found by aliens. And then when Simon 99.5% convinced me that that was never going to happen, I wasn't cross with him, but I was disappointed. And then about eight years ago, NASA confirmed that Voyager 1 has left our solar system. Voyager 1 is no longer born on the solar wind from our star. And when I heard that news, a couple of thoughts occurred to me. The first was that maybe Voyager 1 is still a messenger, but her message is back to us on Earth, because for somewhere in between the foreseeable future and the end of time, certainly for as, as long as we can hear her signal, Voyager 1 is going to be sending back a message to us that says, no, no one has found me yet. There's no one else out here. There's just you lot back at home. Look after yourselves. And then the other thought that occurred to me was that the Voyager space probes have become the something else out there that I need to believe in. And that's when I started telling this story. And then seven years ago, end of 2014, the European Space Agency landed a spacecraft on a comet. Now, you might remember seeing this in the news. The ESA's Rosetta mission put the Feely lander down onto comet 67P of gerasimenko and I had the sensation of the future arriving. Now, the Feely lander didn't build a replica of itself and take off again, uh, but it did drill 20 centimetres into the comet and take samples to analyse in its onboard laboratory. It's an uncrewed spacecraft, but it's got an onboard laboratory. I'd kept in touch with Simon off and on since we first met, and I suddenly felt like there was a lot more to talk about. So I got in touch with him, and he agreed. He was happy to meet up. So we looked at our diaries, and of course it was going to be about about three months before we could actually sit down in the same place together. So what we decided to do in advance is we would both get our DNA mapped and then when we met each other, we'd be able to compare the results. So three months later, sort of February 2015, and we're both sitting at a small table at the University of Sheffield Arms. It's very close to the university. I'm just going to the university for a meeting. That's what I say. First thing we did is we compared our DNA results and we both agreed they were actually really disappointing. I think we'd both been hoping for evidence of our colourful global ancestry, but it turns out if you just pay 99 quid to spit into a plastic test tube to stick in a jiffy bag in the post, you don't get back quite the level of uh, you know, scientific detail and rigour that we were hoping for. What we did ascertain though is that the two of us are both very, very Northern European and we are 2.8 and 3.2% Neanderthal. It's quite average. What Simon wanted to talk about was extremophiles. So, extremophiles is the name that we give to species who can survive in an environment that we wouldn't survive in. So, uh, hypothermophiles, they like it hot. Creophiles, they like it cold. Barophiles, they like it under pressure at the bottom of the ocean. And xerophiles, they like it dry in the desert. But the problem with us calling these species extremophiles is it suggests that where they live is the extremes, is the edges, because where we are, where we live, is in the middle, where it's normal. But an environment is only extreme if you're not adapted to live in it. You know, we talk about survival of the fittest. What we should actually talk about is survival of the optimally adapted for the current conditions. 
You know, look at Homo sapiens. We're, we're adapted to live on the bit of the world we live on, not all of the inhabited world. Most northern Europeans find most of the rest of the planet intolerably hot for most of the rest of the year. And that's the problem with us looking for Goldilocks planets, isn't it? We're looking for Earth-like planets, and we call them Goldilocks planets because Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, the Earth is just right. This isn't to scale, my little model here. And I've just realised some mercury there. So we look for these Goldilocks planets in what's known as the habitable zone around other stars. And the habitable zone is based on how far the Earth is from our Sun. And that's all right, that's fair enough, but it's a bit simplistic because that assumes that Mars is is a cold planet because of how far it is from the sun. And that's partly true, yes, but Mars is also a cold planet because it's a small planet. It's lost its inner heat much faster than the Earth, its surface area to volume ratio again. If the Earth was as far from the sun as Mars is, it would be colder than the Earth is now, but not as cold as Mars is now. And it would still sustain life. Not human life, but life that is more adapted for the cold. But of course, we're looking for Goldilocks planets because we're looking for life as we know it. We're looking for carbon-based life. And that makes sense because carbon-based life has been very successful on the Earth. It allows for complexity. But it might not be all that's out there. You know, there's been, it's been one of the great tropes of science fiction, hasn't it, to, to imagine what a non-carbon-based life form might be like. <clears throat> there's the idea that the alien in the film Alien is actually a silicon-based life form. That's why it can do the extendy jaw thing. But the problem with that idea is that a silicon-based life form wouldn't hunt humans because it wouldn't get any nutritional value from a carbon-based life form, would it? And it would never actually meet humans either because it would actually have to exist at a range of temperatures much colder than humans could survive at. So if it did ever get on board a spaceship like the Nostromo, it would actually just melt and drain away through that, you know, science fiction flooring they have in the spaceships. I still meet up with Simon once or twice a year for one of these astrophysics dates. And one of the things that I like about having a chat with Simon is usually when we meet, he'll come out with a bit of science that, that reinforces what I believe, you know, that, that backs up what I like to think. But occasionally, he'll come out with some science, a theory or even a bit of evidence that's actually a real challenge to what I like to think. The other problem with us looking for Goldilocks planets, of course, is that it assumes the way the Earth is now is typical of its whole lifespan. And of course it isn't, particularly not in terms of temperature. The Earth right now is very cold. The average surface temperature on the Earth right now is a good 10 degrees below the average surface temperature on the Earth's four and a half billion year lifespan. We're, and that's because we're actually in, a, in, in the middle of an ice age. We're just at this funny little warm interglacial blip in the middle of the Ice Age. And what we would expect to happen next from the evidence of previous behaviour is, is that the Earth will get very cold. And it will ice over, in fact. And then after a while, it will warm up. And when it does warm up, it will get much, much hotter than it is now. And it looks like we've affected the climate so much that actually we're going to skip the very cold bit and just go straight to the very hot bit. But either way, the Earth is going to get much hotter than it is now. And yet we have this arrogant idea that we are somehow caretakers of the planet. You know, this idea that global warming is bad because it's bad for the planet. Global warming is not bad for the planet. Global warming is what the planet does, along with global cooling. All we affect is the schedule. You know, global warming is bad, but it's bad because it's bad for us and our grandchildren and their grandchildren. We should just admit that. I interrupted Simon. I said, no, hang on a minute. This idea that we're not caretakers takers, right? So I read this thing in a book. Okay, what if there was a really bad virus, right, that wiped out all of humanity? This is 2015, remember? <laughs> what if there was a really bad virus that wiped out all of humanity and and then there's no one looking after the nuclear reactors, and so the nuclear reactors all overheat and explode, and that causes a chain reaction, and all the nuclear warheads explode, and so there's a massive thermonuclear Armageddon all around the globe because we are not here to take care of things anymore. Well, yeah, that would wipe out a lot of species, wouldn't it? Uh, and then there'd be a nuclear winter, um, so it would be very cold and very dark because no sunlight was, would be getting through to the planet and that would wipe out a lot of other species. But species that like the cold and the dark, they'd survive. Well, they'd thrive, in fact. And, and actually, 
a, a nuclear winter might last a couple of decades, maybe, but in a in a in galactic time, that's nothing, is it? Four and a half billion year lifespan, a couple of decades, it's not even a tea break, is it? You know, so the nuclear winter would blow over and the planet would still be here and life would still be here. But if you want to talk about us being caretakers, the obvious response is we're not doing a very good job of it, are we? Because the Homo sapiens are currently curating a global mass extinction event on the Earth, aren't we? But although, to be fair, as global mass extinction events go, it is only a little one. If you go back to the PT mass extinction event, that's the Permian Triassic mass extinction event 250 million years ago. Scientists call that the great dying because it wiped out 90% of the species on the Earth. But that made way for the dinosaurs and they stuck around to the KT mass extinction event. That's the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction event 65 million years ago. It's KT, not CT, because it's in German or something. And that wiped out 60% of the species on Earth. But up to that point, the biggest mammal on the Earth was about the size of a shrew. But once the dinosaurs were out of the way, mammals could get much bigger and become the dominant family of species on the Earth. So without those two mass extinction events, we wouldn't even be here. But I'll tell you what is interesting. The first species to cause a mass extinction event on the Earth through its behaviour was cyanobacteria. Three and a half billion years ago, they kick-started the, uh, the oxygen catastrophe. And they're still around, so by that measure, they're the most successful species on Earth. But since then, the only other species on the planet that has caused a mass extinction event through its behaviour is us, is Homo sapiens. I've not thought of it like that before. I'll have to put that in a lecture. <laughs> so the last time I saw Simon, I, I asked him the big question. So will human beings ever get to Mars? Simon tells me we have the theoretical know-how, we just don't have the political will. Which is a shame, he says, because we know that investment in space exploration always more than pays for itself in the boost that it gives the economy. And there's always the technological trickle down, which you can't predict, but it is always useful. You know, it'll turn out that some material that is designed for building spaceships out of is actually really good for making frying pans as well. And just philosophically says, the act of putting human beings onto another planet would let us ask such fundamental questions about who we are and our place in the galaxy, but we just don't have the political will. I also found out that Simon likes to measure the cost of space exploration in units of military vehicle, specifically the unit of the aircraft carrier. Because NASA's proposed mission to Mars, Mars One, and which is what the film and the book The Martian is based on, and uh, Simon tells me that the science in The Martian is pretty much rock solid. That mission, Mars One, would cost about $30 billion. That's about 21.5 billion pounds. That's a lot of pounds, isn't it? But it's only about seven aircraft carriers, and we've just bought two of those, haven't we? In the UK, we paid for the HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince Charles, $6.2 billion, the two of them. And we bought those on our own in the UK. The $30 billion cost of a mission to Mars would be shared between about 20 different countries, so it wouldn't actually be that expensive. The expensive bit is getting off the planet. It's the amount of fuel you have to burn to... Uh, to get the speed to escape the Earth's gravitational pull. We, we call that velocity V1. With a mission to Mars, the trick would be to send all of your supplies and your equipment first, including um, a fuel generator, so you don't have to take the weight of the fuel for the return journey all the way there. And you don't need to bring that stuff back, so you can basically just crash land it onto Mars, gently, obviously, but you crash land that onto Mars. And then when it's all there safely and working, then you send the crew. You send the people last. And you do that at a point when, when the Earth and Mars are close to each other in their orbits. And that's still going to be a six-month journey to get to Mars. And in that time, the planets are going to get further away again, aren't they? So the crew are going to have to wait like nine months until the planets are close enough for the return journey, and then that's another six months back. Let's allow an extra month onto each part of that mission just to be safe. So that's 24 months. And that's as far as I think we'll ever go a two-year mission to Mars. Because to send a crew any further than Mars means they're going to have to travel such distances at such speeds for such great lengths of time, they're going to need to be so modified and enhanced in order to survive that experience that it's going to become a philosophical question as to whether or not they are still human.
Simon tells me that one of the ways that we are going to enhance astronauts for the rigours of extreme spaceflight in the future is something we already have called epigenetics. Now, you'll be pleased to know that this is only going to be a simple explanation of epigenetics because that's all I can do, but it is fundamentally an accurate one. So I don't know about you, but when I picture my DNA... Does anyone else? Is that weird? Does anyone else picture their DNA? I imagine my DNA wafting around in my cells in, in nice little strands, you know. But apparently, that's not very accurate. It's more accurate to picture your DNA in a scrunched-up ball. Now, the way DNA works, simply, is that it gives instructions to your cells to build proteins, and it's the proteins that your cells build that let your body do the things it does, that make your body what it is. Now, what scientists have discovered is, homo sapiens, we only use about 2% of our DNA at any one time, and it's the 2% of the DNA that's on the surface of the scrunched-up ball. But the other 98%, it's not junk, it's not wasting away, we're just keeping it in the cupboard until we need it. Because as we get older, our bodies need to do different things, or the environment around us might change, and our bodies might need, might need to respond. And our bodies can flip a genetic switch, so different DNA is on the surface of the ball, different instructions are being given, and different DNA proteins are getting produced, and our bodies can do different things. The most obvious example of this is lactose tolerance, because Homo sapiens are naturally lactose intolerant. But just before we're born, our bodies know that they're going to need to be able to digest milk. So we flip the genetic switch and we turn lactose tolerance on. And then we digest milk for a couple of years. And then when we don't need to do that anymore, and because there's, a, there's an energy cost to keeping lactose tolerance on, we flip the genetic switch and we turn lactose tolerance off and become lactose intolerant. Unless we're born into a society that drinks a lot of milk and eats a lot of cheese. In which case, most of us keep lactose tolerance switched on because it's useful. And you can actually map this around the world with dairy consumption. So in the UK, we like cheese, we like chocolate, we like a latte. Only 16% of us go back to being lactose intolerant. But in Sweden, where they like cheese and chocolate even more than we do, only 4% of the population go back to being lactose intolerant. In India, where only one in four households can afford a fridge, in the north of the country, where it's still just about cool enough to keep milk fresh overnight without a fridge, 30% of the population are lactose intolerant. But in southern India, where it's too hot to keep milk fresh at all without a fridge, 70% of the population are lactose intolerant. And in the Native American population, who've never drunk another species' milk, which is a bit weird when you hear it expressed like that, isn't it? <laughs> drink another species' milk? <laughs> Lactose intolerance in the adult population of Native Americans is basically 100%. Now that scientists know that our bodies can flip those genetic switches internally, they're learning to flip them externally. So an important thing to remember about epigenetics is it can only teach our bodies to do things that actually they already know how to do, that we already have the genetic programming to do. But there is one form of genetic uh, modification that can teach our bodies to do something that they didn't previously have the genetic coding to do, and that's known as CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R. And this is a naturally occurring biodefense mechanism that scientists originally discovered in single-celled bacteria. And if a single-celled bacteria is attacked by a virus, and a virus is just a little bit of genetic material, basically, and it gets into the, vi into the bacteria, and then it reproduces itself using the bacteria cell resources, and then eventually it kills the bacteria cell. But if the bacteria can fight off the virus and kill it, what it then does with that viral DNA is it chops it up, and it splices the viral DNA into the gaps in its own DNA, and it sort of keeps it in the cupboard as like a, a wanted poster or a Know Your Enemy booklet. And so the next time it meets that virus, it can kill it much more easily. So what scientists first discovered is that the cells don't need to have killed the virus themselves to chop up the viral DNA. You can just give them dead viral DNA and they can chop it up and learn from it. And then scientists discovered that they can transfer the CRISPR biomechanic from single cell bacteria into more complex organisms like mammals. And in this way, we're using CRISPR to teach human cells to fight cancer cells. And then they discovered that actually the CRISPR biomechanic will chop in other sorts, of uh, other sorts of DNA, not just dead viral DNA, but active DNA that can teach our cells to do different things. So 
CRISPR biomechanic can get a cell to splice in instructions on how to create different eye colour, for example, or different hair colour. One of the leading scientists working on CRISPR is on record as saying that in the foreseeable future, we will be able to use CRISPR biomechanic to turn a living poodle into a living Labrador. In 2014, scientists in China did the first CRISPR experiments on human embryos. And this might seem like pretty advanced genetic modification, but there's all that all that day-to-day -day genetic modification that we've all sort of forgotten about. You know, we've, we've, uh, we've modified E. coli so it can produce biofuel. We've enhanced different species of fungi so they can produce insulin. We've taken genetic material from Arctic fish and spliced it into potatoes to make them more resistant to frost. But those potatoes not vegetarian anymore. <laughs> We've enhanced the life of the earthworm, the lifespan of the earthworm, by 400%. We've increased the memory and the intelligence of mice. We've isolated the gene that makes some voles monogamous. So now we can make all of the voles monogamous <laughs> if we want to. <laughs> Scientists are well on the way to being able to implant a genetically engineered woolly mammoth egg into a mother elephant, and there's already a waiting list of Homo sapiens volunteers ready to carry a Neanderthal fetus when that has been genetically engineered. The American military are well underway with a program of neurological and mechanical enhancements of flies, other insects and sharks to turn them into living robot spies. <laughs> living robots. <laughs> Cyborgs. It's like we imagined this stuff in science fiction in the 1970s in order to make it possible to invent it now. And cyborg technology is much more prevalent than you might realise. There's already hearing aids known as bionic ears that are tiny little implants that we put into our ears and they can detect all of the sound around us. And within that sound, they can, they can identify the human voices and enhance those human voices to make them clearer. But then they don't, they don't amplify that sound to your eardrum. They just feed that sound directly into your brain as electronic impulses through the central auditory nerve. If you've got one of these bionic ears and a smartphone, you can play music or podcasts directly into your brain via Bluetooth and no one else in the meeting knows. <laughs> Robotic eyes are well enough developed to be able to orient yourself in a room and detect faces and detect text. There's a guy in America who was born colorblind, and he's got a third eye that sits on he, the top of his head, a mechanical eye, and it plugs into the uh, socket in the back of his skull, and that eye allows him to see in color, but also to see in infrared. He's the world's first officially designated cyborg. It says so in his passport which I presume he needs because it probably sets off the security scanner at the airport, doesn't it? You might have heard of Jesse Sullivan and Claudia Mitchell, two Americans who both have thought-controlled prosthetic arms. Now, it's true, the current models of thought-controlled prosthetic limbs, they are a bit clumsy and a bit clunky, but one of the great things about thought-controlled prosthetic limbs is you can just upgrade them every couple of years when a new model comes out, just like you do with your mobile phone. And the next generation of thought-controlled prosthetic limbs are going to be stronger and more dexterous, and you're going to be able to continue to control them with your thoughts, even when they are not attached to your body. We've already done experiments with chimpanzees where they can carry on controlling their thought-controlled prosthetic limb when it's on the other side of the room because you, you, you control a thought control prosthetic limb through a brain to computer interface so you can control your prosthetic limb when it's in a different building or a different city or anywhere in the world as long as you've got an internet connection and this next generation of thought control prosthetic limbs they're going to be able to detect temperature and texture and the mechanical equivalent of pain and send that information back to the brain that is controlling them. So that will be a brain and a computer in two-way communication. And once we can do that, how long do you think it'll be before we take a computer and put it in two-way communication with two or more human brains? And when we do that, will those brains be able to think to each other? And how long will it be anyway before someone who isn't missing any limbs but just, just has a load of money fancies one of these detachable thought control prosthetic limbs for a laugh? 
probably won't surprise you to discover that when I was a kid, I read a lot of superhero comics. Uh, I was Marvel, not DC, and my favorite superhero was Spider-Man. And one of my favorite Spider-Man villains was Dr. Octopus. Dr. Octopus was a scientist who had got four metal prosthetic limbs, tentacles, that he could detach from his body and they could walk around on their own, controlled by his brain. Dr. Octopus isn't science fiction anymore. There is a growing school of thought that says that whilst Homo sapiens might have wiped out every other human species on the earth, what we are about to do is create the species that will supersede us. Homo prevalidus, if you like, the enhanced human. And a thought occurs to me, so whilst I no longer believe that we'll ever get visited by a spaceship and a load of aliens will get out. What I can now imagine happening in my lifetime or in my children's lifetime is that we will send a spaceship out of our solar system and into the galaxy and the crew will not be homo sapiens. Meanwhile, Voyager 1 is still out there. 14.2 billion miles from home. That's so far that when Mission Control send Voyager instructions, those instructions travel at the speed of light and they still take 21, over 21 hours to get there. And when Voyager sends her data back to Earth, it's another 21 hour wait. Voyager Mission Control isn't in NASA headquarters anymore. It's in a small industrial unit on the outskirts of Pasadena in California, next to a gardening and landscaping supplies, opposite a McDonald's. They can't upgrade the two Voyagers themselves, of course, so they're still stuck with some of that original 1970s kit. But what they have done is they've upgraded the user interface. So now most of the most of the engineering instructions they need to send to Voyager, they can do it using a smartphone app. No one expected the Voyagers to still be, alive, still be operational in 2021. No one except maybe the engineers who built them, because they understood how important this mission was. And so, without telling anyone, they upgraded the spec and they built the Voyagers out of much higher quality components than they were meant to. And consequently, the Voyagers are still operational, and consequently, most of the Voyager mission control team are in their 60s or 70s now. Most of them have, have passed up opportunities for promotion or to move on to newer, more exciting missions. So they kind of love this mission. They kind of love these spacecraft. I don't think any of them are expecting Voyager 1 to get picked up by aliens. What they love is the data they get, the partial picture that Voyager 1 paints of the galaxy outside of our solar system. But it won't be too much longer before they're all retired. And it won't be too much longer after that that none of them are with us anymore. They're working on a mission that will outlive them. They're working on a mission that, we, that is greater than their collective endeavour. But they can tell themselves that story, they can imagine that future when they're no longer here but Voyager 1 is still out there. And they can tell us that story if we want to listen. But that message that I imagined Voyager 1 sending back to the Earth, it isn't going to be until the end of time, is it? It is only going to be for the foreseeable future. Because ever since those last photographs were taken in 1990, they've been gradually switching off Voyager's equipment to say battery power. And in 2025, there will just be one sensor left active on Voyager. And then in 2035 or 2036, Voyager 1's plutonium generator will finally give up the ghost. And Voyager 1 will be out there alone in radio silence forever. One of the messages on Voyager's golden record 
isn't a greeting. It's a farewell. It says, good night, ladies and gentlemen. Goodbye, and see you next time. And another one says simply, welcome home. Thanks a lot. Thank you.